a Moritz Dieriter. Other than being a Purdue alumni, he was also our very first NSAC president way back in 2006. He has a very diverse work profile, having worked in academia, for the government, in industry, and for startups. Our interviewer for today is Sam, ECE PhD student, and he was also the NSAC president for the last two years. Thank you, Sam. Okay, so to get started, I I took a look through your kind of LinkedIn profile, right, to, to try to get an idea of, of how your career has sort of progressed over the last few years. Or, and I'm still trying to wrap my head around what exactly happened between 1997 and 2003. So can you try to explain how in the world does somebody have a biology degree, is a NASA engineer, and also is getting an aerospace degree? <laughs> at the same so, time? Uh, that's a good question. Um, so first of all, I wasn't a full-time engineer until after I graduated. Uh, I mm -hmm. did a co-op uh, at, at NASA Johnson, and I, I think this, that Purdue still has a co-op program. Okay. Uh, so I would all semesters working and going to school. Okay. Uh, and then as for the biology degree, uh, there there is an official story <clears throat> uh, it, that revolves around uh, uh, wanting to, to pursue bioengineering in a way that uh, I couldn't do through the bioengineering department. Um, mm -hmm. In reality, I thought it was interesting and there were some people in the class that I liked hanging around with. Um, okay. And and so it seemed like a good idea at the time. And then obviously sort of in your career, you decided to go uh, along the aerospace route. The, the engineering I think was more interesting uh, than the biology. Um, mm -hmm. And it, it helped a lot that when I finished my co-op as an undergrad, I was a job uh, at okay. Johnson Space Center. And so I took a job full time then as a uh, flight controller for the space station. So you became a full time engineer at NASA from and you worked there for a year. So what what does that job? What did that job look like? For the space station at the time, NASA was flying the space shuttles and the space station. Now they just have the space station. Um, mm -hmm. But the space station is is obviously in full time and it has crew full time. And so mm -hmm. there's an entire group of people on the ground in the control room who monitor all the space station systems. Uh, okay. So you can see them on you know, NASA TV. There's a, a flight director and a bunch of people watching data on consoles. Mm -hmm. What you don't see, each one of those people at a console has a whole room of people behind them who are okay. watching even more. And so you, know, you might have one uh, life control systems officer in the front control room, and that person has two or three people in the back who are watching more data. Oh, wow. So which part of the data were you uh, watching? Uh, it's called ECLIS, Environmental Control and Life Support Systems. Okay, so I'm assuming all these articles about all these uh, little holes that are appearing in the uh, in the space station right now are probably, probably making you think, I am so glad <laughs> that I don't have to deal with this. Uh, they, are, they are the most professional and the highest trained people in the industry. The astronauts could not be in better hands. Right. Yeah, it definitely seems like they're doing a great job. But I imagine that the stress levels must be much higher than normal. Uh, uh, it's, it's always a high stress job. But OK. Yeah. yeah. Yes. No, what what, what I, about that job stressed you out the most? Uh, well, you're you're the person responsible for keeping the crew alive. OK. And you're the one watching you know, not just things like oxygen concentration, but you're watching, you know, power draw to fans, making sure there's not a short circuit, watching water levels, watching carbon dioxide levels, making sure the carbon dioxide recycling unit works properly. Okay. Uh, you know, everything, everything the crew needs to eat, survive. breathe, and, and survive is the responsibility of EQUIS. Okay, so now, so you were at NASA from 2002 to 2003. So now you obviously decided to come to Purdue to become a Boilermaker. Purdue is a, is a gem. It's a, it's a really fantastic institution, and it's a good place to get your career start. So, okay. yeah, so the, it was kind of a no-brainer at the time. Yeah, yeah. So you, you go, you came, and I see that you came in to do your Master's of Engineering as compared to doing a direct PhD or um, was there, so how did, how did you pick your advisor? Uh, how did you pick sort of the research area you wanted to go into um, and, and what what prompted these decisions, right? Because that's a big, big step to go. It was. Um, and a lot of it was predicated on, you know, sort of practicality. You know, mm. the 
uh, the uh, question of what what professor to work for was very strongly colored by which professors had positions available and had funding. I didn't I didn't have any professors, you know, ideally picked out that I wanted to work for. I, my set got narrowed down to one fairly quickly. Um, okay, that was, that was Professor Raman in the mechanical engineering department, Arvind Raman. Mm -hmm. uh, he he had funding available and he had a project that required someone who could sort of speak biology because he was collaborating with the structural biology department. Uh, okay. And someone who could speak engineering because it was a nonlinear nonlinear dynamics problem. Okay, uh, I see. So, so basically, were, your your master's in mechanical engineering was focused on like the nonlinear dynamics of, of in bio. I see. And so then you've done you did your master's degree, and then obviously, uh, you know, your whole career after Purdue is involved aerospace so i'm assuming your phd and i think your thesis was titled uh, uh, it was a focus of combustion research so how did how did you make that jump and decision right because it's it, it's like a, it's like i'm seeing like an interesting like there's like a, a almost like a, a two-state system right it's like bio aerospace yes. bio aerospace mm -hmm. um no so i you know i had never uh, i had never worked with an afm or in at the nanoscale before. So that was really interesting for quite a long time. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I, I, like I said, my master's project involved working with the structural biology department on these virus capsids. Yeah. Um, and, you know, like many experiments, it had its challenges. And one of the biggest challenges that we faced cropped up right at the very end. Uh, mm -hmm. I had my thesis written, I was ready to submit it. Uh, oh. The data made very little sense. Um, virus capsids should be structurally perfect. And my yeah. stiffness plot was bimodal. I had two peaks, um, okay. which was really weird, and we couldn't explain it. Mm -hmm. And I, I probably spent a good three months um, digging through the biology and contacting various you know, biology professors and reading a bunch of papers. And yeah. what I discovered was really unfortunate. Um, we discovered that the protocol that our, uh, our team had used to create the virus capsids was flawed. Oh, and no. that instead of creating uh, copies of perfectly icosahedral empty virus capsids, we had made random denatured protein blobs. Oh, that's terrible. So, you know, some of the experimental, experimental methods that we developed to attach these things to the mica substrate were still valid, but right. the core point of the research was now useless. Um, right. And so, so that was a that was a very disheartening experience, um, and it, it led to a number of conversations uh, between my advisor and myself, um, some of which were quite frank. Uh, and and at the end of that, you know, I decided that it was really time to move on and look at, at new things and and see what other uh, fun and exciting stuff was at Purdue to go and do, right. rather than go to the beginning and repeat four or five years worth of the experiments again. Right. Um, uh, and so, oh, this, so this I, is I actually a, a really like I know a lot of people like definitely graduate students have been in very similar positions. So mm -hmm. if we go back, because the problem is like you know now we see you as a, a very successful person in in you know in your life. How did you uh, how did you end up you know dealing with this kind of failure? And what did you I guess more importantly. Back then, like when you started this bio degree, what was your goal? Academia? Did you want to, you know, become a biologist? Because you you had these discussions with your advisor, which I'm assuming are about your future, sort of as a career. So what was like if we go back to 2003, 2004, when you're writing your thesis, what was your like dream job? Uh, well, so 2003, 2004, I was still in the middle of collecting data. So right. if I go to 2005, where I had the data and I'm writing the thesis, and I've now discovered that the the substrate is is bunk. Um, yeah. You know, the conversation really was not yet about, you know, what career do you want long term. It was more, what are we going to do to salvage the project? Yeah. Uh, the professor the professor had you know sufficient funds to repeat the experiments, and and you know the conversation was, are you interested in repeating them? And I felt yeah. at the time that. I was going to get nothing out of repeating the experiments, that there was no benefit to my education, uh, and there was very little benefit to the point of the project. There were other research groups that we were working with that did have success. And yeah. so 
you know, there were, there were, there were other efforts that were going to come along. And so we decided that it was at the end, not a worthwhile thing to go and do. Okay. Uh, and so. And was that something you decided like talking to your advisor or was it more of like, you came to this realization and we're just slowly like, dude, I'm not he, doing. He and I reached that conclusion together. Okay. So it was just back and forth saying like, you know, basically your goal was to gain more skills and to learn more uh, about things in general, rather than repeating the same techniques over and over again, you know, just to get a result. Right. So, okay. So, so you have these discussions with the advisor and now how did you, at some point you had to tell him basically like, I'm leaving your group, you know, good luck. Mm -hmm. uh, how did that go? How did yes. you do it? Uh, are um, you on? <laughs> well, it, it certainly didn't go well. Uh, you know, that's an awkward conversation to have with anyone, um, right. you know, and, and I'm sure everybody on the phone is aware the relationship between a student and an advisor is complicated, you know, in yeah. a lot of ways. It's, it's like a parent uh, in another set of ways. It's like a spouse, you know, mm -hmm. you're you're intricately linked with this person um, academically and intellectually for your whole career. Uh, and mm -hmm. so severing that relationship is hard. Um, okay. And and there's a there's a strong lesson learned there, I think, you know, and one of the pieces of advice that I give to uh, undergraduate and graduate students when I encounter them, I tell all my interns this at work, uh, is when you are thinking about going to graduate school or you're thinking about an advanced degree, don't look at your advisor for what they do. Look at your advisor for who they are and how they work. Mm -hmm. because that relationship is so much more important than the project, uh, mm -hmm. you know, you can you can find interesting things to do in 99 out of 100 labs at a university. There's yeah. there's no shortage of fun and interesting and engaging work. Um, mm -hmm. What's a lot rarer and a lot more difficult to find is a engaging and fun and supportive advisor. Um, yeah, and, and it's not it's not to say that some advisors are bad. I think all the advisors are good, but sometimes the match isn't there. Right, right. Yeah, I, I guess from like from my background, right, I actually have two advisors and it's fascinating to me to see how different they are in how they approach their work, how they approach, you know, certain problems. So completely like they have almost diametrically opposite approaches to work. And it's yeah, like I, I definitely agree with you. It's your advisor. That relationship is unbelievably important. Yeah, and so so now you've you've told the, your advisor, you know, I'm I'm not going to keep doing this. So now, you know, you're at Purdue. So how did the the next uh, step happen, right? Um, so uh, I went home, and I went to the library website, and I downloaded in bulk all of the papers that the ME professors had written in the last five or ten years. Okay, and I just started reading. Mm -hmm. And I had a few. I had a few really simple rules because at the time I'd already been accepted into the PhD program. I'd already uh, yeah. uh, passed my area exams, right? So yeah. it was literally just do the do the dissertation, the prelim, final, uh, and right. so I was sort of way into the PhD process. Mm -hmm. um, so I didn't want to lose a tremendous amount of ground, but I did want to find somewhere where I felt like I could contribute and where there was a real need and. Uh, you know, where I wouldn't have four or five years of catch up work to do. So right. in reading these papers, I had, a, I had a few fairly simple rules. You know, if I read the abstract of a paper yeah. and I was so bored that I couldn't read anymore, I would discard that entire professor's stack. Okay. Well, that's if, if there were symbols in the, in the abstract that I didn't understand, right. Mm -hmm. Or that I'd never seen before, that whole stack goes away. Um, okay. If, if I read the paper and I got a very strong sense of this is this is research that is is not uh, at, there is no potential for this to be useful to help anyone, then that okay. professor's stack would go away. And, okay, okay. And with a couple of really simple things in mind, it was pretty easy to narrow it down to three or four professors, and I went to go talk to them. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, I approached a professor in the mechanical engineering department, and and. He was a brilliant advisor, 
and and I wanted to join his lab. And yeah. uh, as part of the conversation, he said, you know, I've, I've listened to your story. Give me a week. I'm going to go talk to all of your professors. I'm going to review your grades. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'll, I'll come back and tell you what I think. Yeah. So a week later, I went back to his office. Uh, and, and he said to me, Mo, I, I have to be honest. I don't think you're a good fit for my lab. Okay. Uh, I took your transcript. Uh, you don't have enough math background. You don't have mm -hmm. enough computer science background. Uh, I don't think you are a, um, I don't think you're a fit. Uh, yeah. And he says, but I did talk to all your professors and all of them said very nice things. And they all said kind of the same thing. And I, based on those conversations, I don't think you're a theorist. I think you're an experimentalist. Mm -hmm. And I had never considered that. That was, that was new information to me. Um, okay. But Professor Merkel took all of the initiative to go find that out and really try and understand what kind of a student I was. Yeah. Uh, and he then actually pointed me to the Aero Astro department and said, you need to go talk to Professor Anderson and Professor Heaster. They yeah. do the experiments that I model in my lab. Yeah. Uh, and I happen to know they have a research program open. They have a spot open and they have a project that's funded that needs a PhD student. Oh, wow. And so that's how that... That's how that match got made, right? So, you know, it was a case of I had done my half of the work to really sit down and find out what I thought would be interesting and engaging and I would be good at. Yeah. And Professor Merkel, who eventually did become one of my advisors, yeah. uh, did, did his half of the work um, and then put me in touch with Professor Anderson, who became my primary advisor. So okay. wow. it, it was a, a very strong piece of, you know, a lot of honesty and a lot of communication led to a, a really awesome experience. I had a fantastic experience as a PhD student. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, actually, I had a, a pretty similar, uh, actually, thing happen to me. Whenever I was graduating from undergrad, I was thinking about going into applied mathematics. I actually have degrees in physics and mathematics. And my academic advisor was like, dude, like, you should totally go to engineering because you love to build stuff. <laughs> Like, go apply there, right? Like, clearly. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, now I, I work in, like, optics and like, micro mechanics and things like this. And so it's get to use of both. But it's a much better fit than just pure math. Uh, so so now we, we kind of go, you found your advisor through, basically, okay. you had the Purdue Guardian Angel uh, that, that helped you kind of get this position. Because these people in your life, they change your life, you know, so much like your the whole direction of your life changed basically so you go you do your phd so what is like a, if we go back in time what's a day in the life look like uh it was a lot of um mechanical design and analysis uh finite element analysis on a combustor uh, mm -hmm. a lot of catching up on, on theory um, mm -hmm. the experiment was actually in heat transfer and it was, it was part of a, a larger study that was funded by NASA to collect CFD validation data. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it was, you know, understanding what does the funding agency want and, and why are they collecting this data? Because that impacts how I collect the data. Um, right. and then the, the, the actual operation of the test was, was, uh, quite stressful. We had to get the test facility set up, um, the, the high pressure lab out at Purdue at Zucro Labs out by the airport mm -hmm. uh, is a really sophisticated place to be. Um, it took me about 18 months to set up my experiment and we collected yeah. all the data in one day. We ran all the hot fire tests in, in one marathon session uh, okay. because it's, you know, those experiments where it takes you forever to get everything set up. Uh, yeah get all the sensors working just right and get all the instrumentation working just right and get the computers working just right. Uh, yeah. Make sure nothing leaks, you know, cause you know, you, you get to that point 17 times and then every time something happens and you can't proceed. And right. so it's like it's on the beach every time you get closer. And then one day when everything is, is right and working properly, then it works and then you just keep going. Yeah. Until, until you get the results. So yeah, that's, how so like these types of experiments they're very tough because it's an experiment like you don't know the result so how do you keep yourself motivated and focused right on the task at hand right 
because it's it's that's like a really tough thing to do right when it's so much like prep work with no result like for, because it's over a year right of just constantly trying yeah. to build this thing and then you don't know if you put it on the test stand it just doesn't doesn't do anything right or uh -huh. completely off and then you unpublishable right so how do you yep. how do you keep that doubt at bay uh or well i think i think that's i think that's that's the the primary benefit that stem students have over other students right mm -hmm. and that scientists and engineers have over really anyone else ever um, yeah. we have a gift we have an arbitrator of truth that no one else has right you know uh you know the, the 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 rocket engine doesn't care what my spreadsheet says it doesn't care what my math said it doesn't care what the analysis said it obeys the laws of physics and yeah. when you combine the propellants it will catch fire and it will do what it's going to do and yeah. that's a terribly exciting thing right yeah. when when you you get to appeal to reality to give you an answer right, right. it's not the same it's not the same as defending a thesis Right. You yeah. go in front of your committee and you defend and that's not reality. That's the opinion of four people. Right. Right. One of them could be having a bad day or miss their coffee that morning. And so you have a bad reality that day uh, or you have a bad experience that day. But, you know, when you're in the lab, you know, or you're on the test stand and you you get to run a test, physics never has a bad day. It's always perfect. And that's a that's a fantastic feeling when, you know, you get to see data for the first time. Um, it's like a drug. Once you once you see it and you get hooked on it, it never leaves you. Yeah, yeah, I I definitely know what you mean because there's there is something that is so satisfying about doing all this work and then yeah. sort of bending these laws to to your will. It's a very kind of mm -hmm. crazy feeling when it actually works. The mm -hmm. problem is the problem is that on many days it does not work. So how, how do you that's deal not, with that's not physics's fault? No, it's not physics. What I mean is you're like there's an issue, right, with your design. So how do you mm -hmm. like let's say you know you go and you do the experiment, there's just all these setbacks, right? How do you how did you keep yourself motivated to keep going, right? Uh well, a lot of it is, you know, the stubborn desire to finish. Mm -hmm. Right? Stubbornness plays a big part. Um not wanting to quit is a big part of it. Um, and then, you know, you work on a, on a large team at a, at a place like the high pressure lab, there is no single player, you know, there's okay. a team of undergraduates and a team of master's students and a team of PhD students and postdocs that are all working together. And so just because one hot fire test goes badly, there might be six others that are going well, you know, okay. or you might have had a setback on your project, but yeah. you're, your partner has had a series of successes on theirs. And so you, you do get to see, you know, victory and progress happening around you. Mm -hmm. um, it's tremendously motivating, right? When you can work on a team and the people on your team are successful, you know, yeah. a lot of that reflects back on you and, and makes you more successful. And that's true in life too. Oh, it, uh, that's, yeah, I, I, I definitely feel that a lot because uh, it's like my work has been very, very solitary. Um, and so, you know, it's like if stuff doesn't go well, there's no, there's no other person doing this. So it, it's like on fire and it doesn't work and nobody knows why. Um, and so I'm always curious how people keep going, right, in like that kind of a situation. So, okay, so you, you make it through all the setbacks, you get all your data, you write the thesis, you're getting ready to graduate, right, you got the diploma in hand. And now you're walking down the aisle, what what is the dream sort of job like no, the, dream, the dream at the time was definitely to go into industry um, okay and that and that was so when when i got closer to the end of my phd i did have a lot of conversations with uh, all of my advisors about mm -hmm. you know what do you want to do with your career because if you want to go into academia we need to change your project to get more publications right publish more papers um, okay uh, but if you want to go into industry we're going to we're going to give you a project that's a lot more related to the types of projects you'll get in industry which is get things done get the data and move on right okay it's it's more of a you are part of a much larger machine and and you have to be uh able to deliver your product on time uh which is something that industry really values 
Uh, and right. so I, I said I wanted to go into industry. And so I got a project that was part of a very big research program mm -hmm. uh, at, at multiple universities. And okay. I only got one paper out of it. But the data set as a whole is, is vastly useful uh, to somebody like NASA. Okay. So mm -hmm. how did you broach this subject with your advisor? Like, did you, did you go into like, uh, how, like, I guess, did you go to the office and just say, Hey, look, like what's going on? Like, how did, how did you bring it up? Right. I didn't, he did. He, okay. you know, we had, we had weekly meetings and, and he said, uh, Hey, you're going to graduate one day. What do you want to do? Okay. It was a very straightforward conversation. Uh, it it seems know, like the and, whole aero astro department is just a lot of people who like look at the future and, and just like, hey, you got you got to get out, uh, got to get a job. Uh, gotta, uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The the whole field of, of aerospace engineering is is very, uh, I think, to its detriment sometimes is is blunt, um, mm -hmm. and part of that is because I don't think aerospace engineering is any harder or any more difficult than any other field, but it's horrifically unforgiving of mistakes. Right. You know, if, you go, if you go into automotive engineering and your analyst has made a mistake and your left control arm breaks, right, or the tire pops, or you, know, yeah. you blow a head gasket, your car makes a loud noise and you pull over to the side of the road and the engineers gather around and try and figure out what went wrong, right? right. When, when that equivalent mistake happens in a rocket engine test, you spend a month picking bits of shrapnel up out of the desert, trying to figure out what went wrong, right? Right. And, and it's very difficult to reconstruct what happened because your data system has been destroyed. You know. Uh, right. And, so, and your data you set know, is literally in pieces and, all and over so the. You're, yeah. So you're you know busy trying to reconstruct files, and you end up looking at the last few microseconds of a of a tattered data file, you know, trying to understand. You know, my pressure transducer was reading this here, and then it read 50 million PSI on the next data point. So that's clearly garbage. But what about yeah. the one before that? Was that real or not real? And okay, you end up pulling your hair out trying to figure out what died first. I, I would, I would love to actually. Like, I've always been curious how they kind of go back and figure out what broke in a plane, because like some planes mm -hmm. crash, and they're like, oh, this particular bolt on this particular engine failed in this particular way and i've always was like how like how do you how do you figure that out from you know the shrapnel in the field but well I, so uh so i have a, a fun story about that actually um when i worked at spacex we were testing uh, merlin engines which is their first stage boost engine on the falcon rocket uh -huh. and we had <clears throat> we had an incident uh which is a a very polite way of saying we had a very large fireball and the engine went away uh, in the middle of it, okay. um, and you know, we we sent the technicians and the engineers out into the field and picked up a bunch of shrapnel and all came back in big boxes. Yeah, and we laid it all out on a big table, and you know, a lot of it was not identifiable, but a lot of it is, right? You can, yeah. if you've if you lived with the design for a year or two years, you can you can identify a, a broken piece as easily as you can identify a healthy piece. Right, and I found I found a tiny little fragment of my gas generator injector. And uh, it was made out of a particular alloy of copper that's a very specific color. It's a, it's a very light yellow. Uh, yeah. And it's a combustion device, right? So it's full of soot. And we have a couple of different types of combustion that we run in it. We ignite it with a, a pyrophoric liquid called t um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, We have uh, LOX kerosene combustion that happens at different pressures. And low pressure combustion is really light, fluffy soot. And, High pressure combustion really impacts the soot into the surface and bakes it on, so it's really thick black. And so, mm -hmm. you know, you take these pieces and you put them under a, a stereoscope, and you can kind of peel away and you can see what order did things happen in, right? And so, you know, you, you start looking at stuff. And I was, I was just looking around, and I found this this melted chunk of copper, and it had a glob on it that didn't belong. It was a it was the wrong color. It was a a very dark, like a like a gunmetal gray melted blob. Yeah. And I said, there's, that doesn't make sense. How, how does melted metal stick on this part? It doesn't make sense. Yeah. And so I took it back to California, back, back here to Los Angeles, and I put it in a, um, a scanning electron microscope. We could do XRF analysis. So you had a little, you know, element analyzer. 
And the metallurgist came back and said, yeah, this is, this is not copper, obviously. It's, it turns out it's an alloy called A286. Uh-huh. Uh, and there's only one place on the engine where A286 exists, and it's a bolt in the turbo pump. It's the only place. And so we said, this is, this is madness, right? How, why is a, a bolt that's sitting in cryogenic oxygen melting in the first place? Yeah. And if it's melting, how is it getting to this part of the gas generator? They're in completely different parts of the engine. Mm-hmm. Um, if it happened after the fireball, if it happened after the disassembly, the bolt right. would have just fallen. You know, In order to make it to the gas generator, it had to flow through the plumbing. It had to flow through the feed line to get right. here. But it was, if it was melted before it left, it would have started an oxygen fire and would have never made it. So right. it didn't melt until it got here. So it arrived here before it melted, and then right. it melted once it got here. Um, and we were then able to put together that that bolt had impacted the surface of the gas generator and started an ignition event, and that started the fire. Okay. And once once you had that very first seed of a clue, now you have a now you have a, a the equivalent of a hypothesis, right? You can go back yeah. and look at the data and say, okay, where do I see evidence that supports this or prevents this from happening? Right. Um, and I, I have very clear memories of calling the turbo pump engineer and I said, hey, Cam, go look underneath the, the lock shim. You've got six A286 bolts there. I bet one of them is missing its head. And, and I remember his response. He said, Mo, that's nonsense. He didn't use the word nonsense. He was much stronger. But he said, Mo, that's garbage. Um, those those bolts are, are snug down tight and they're held in place they're retained by this giant plate that's sort of top of them. And I said, go look. And so lo and behold, they tore down the pump. And as soon as he took the locks impeller off, there was this giant mangled piece of, of metal in there. Uh, yeah. And one of the bolt heads stripped out and had been rolled around inside the pump and been ejected through the feed system. Oh, and so well, it was a lot of that was luck, right? We happened yeah. to find the right piece in the field. And I happened to be the engineer that was looking at it. Yeah. Um, a lot of it was good policy, right? The, the, the technicians and the engineers knew that they needed to collect everything and look at all the hardware and get the hardware in the hands of the right people. So yeah. it was a lot of communication. It was a lot of teamwork. It was a lot of, you know, get the right person to look at the right piece of data at the right time to figure yeah. out what happened. So I guess that that's... So in their first interview with Professor Appenzeller, they actually... He talked about this that science is is sort of like being a detective in a murder, and yeah, basically for rocket engines, it's it's literally like doing autopsies after somebody's been murdered to try to find the I don't know speck of dust that gives away the, the clue. But that's and, incredible. And, yeah, the the failures don't have to be dramatic, right? You yeah. can you can try and and actuate a valve and it it just clicks, it doesn't move. Right. Or you can try and connect a sensor and it and it doesn't read. Right. Yeah. You turn on a power supply and it gives you the wrong voltage. Um, you know, I think there's a pessimistic way to view those things, which is, you know, these are failures and these are setbacks and these are disheartening. Um, I think a better way to look at it is to say I am engaged in a conversation with my hardware. Right. right. It is telling me what is this hardware trying to tell me. Right. right. It's, it's telling me. The word it's using is bad voltage or open circuit or a leak or why is the steel blue? It wasn't blue before, you know. Right, right. Um, you know why is this weird lump of melted goo sitting on my hardware? You know. Yeah. How did grease get from this point to that point? Why is the soot white? You know, s- s- things that things that no textbook is going to teach you to look for. Right? right. And and if you open yourself to, I'm having a conversation with my with my work and with my hardware, then it's a much more rewarding thing when you finally figure it out and you start listening to it, right. and it will start listening. What is the biggest difference you saw sort of going from a four-person company in terms of management? Like, how do you how did you grow as a manager, right, to deal with so many people? Because uh, I'm assuming that that... So I didn't manage everybody. At the, at right. the very end, the largest group was about 40 people that I managed. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, by and large, people don't want management. They don't want someone to tell them what to do. They know what to do. 
Yeah. Right. And if, if you've done your job as a manager and as a leader, uh, your people won't need you, right? They, they won't be sure that you've done anything at all. Yeah. Um, so a big part of that is making sure that, that everyone on the team has a task, that they understand it, that they know when they need to deliver it, uh, yeah. that it's within their capability, that you know before they do when they're going to have challenges and be ready there with a solution to help them. Okay. Right. And that solution could be, here's a book, here's the page you need, here's a spreadsheet that I made to help you do the analysis. Here's okay. a one sentence description of, of where you've made your mistake. Um, you know, and, and, you know, not, not all of those solutions need to happen before the failure occurs, right? right. They should happen before expensive failures do, mm -hmm. but there is, there is nothing that motivates a person than making a mistake and being able to recover from it and succeed, right? That mm -hmm. feeling of success is the best, the, the best motivation and the best leadership that a person can have, right? Okay. So, wow. You know, that's 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 I think the function of a leader is to really understand what your team is trying to do and help them sort of self organize to to divide up that work. I see. OK, so your your view is that uh, as, a, as a manager and a leader, your job is sort of to grease the skids and make sure the skids are pointed in the right direction. Yes. And then to just let everyone else do the like push push along the the, the boat. It's, it's actually, this sounds a lot like, a, I'm surprised that it sounds a lot like what a good professor mentor actually sounds like. That, you know, most PhD students are very motivated people. That mm -hmm. if you just tell them, go do this, you know, and then help them when they get overly stuck. You know, I think that's yeah. that's pretty you know, much and ideal. And that's true. And, and I would have to say in, you know, 20 years of being a, a technical person, right? I've only met maybe, maybe one or two people that was really just no good, right? Mm. That, that there, that this person was, was truly useless and needed to leave the team, right? It's mm. been extremely rare. Um, right. Almost everyone I've met has been self-motivated and excited and able to do the work and mm -hmm. really sort of engaged in learning. And the things that prevent them from doing that are almost all external. Yeah. Right. Um, I don't I don't need to teach people how to be innovative. They're naturally innovative. Yeah. Right? I don't need people to be passionate. It it helps that I work in rocketry, right? Rockets are a very passion inducing device. Right. Uh, yes. a, a lock in amplifier is not nearly as as sexy as a rocket. Right. Um, right. Right. You know, yeah. Uh, it, it helps when they're big and they're loud and they're dramatic and they make a lot of smoke and, you know, people get really excited about that. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's definitely something that maybe people in, uh, in, in Burke suffer from, right? Because it's like that comic on the wall that's like, uh -huh. no, it's there, I promise. It's just nano. Yeah, yeah but, you know, the, the thrill that you guys get when, you know, when you're, when you're in the lab at three in the morning and that perfect picture of a neuron comes through, yeah. right? Or, or when you've made the, I don't even know what the fab world is at now, three nanometers, five nanometers. I don't know where the, the frontier is. Yeah, right? When I was, I was like 30 nanometers, right? That's, yeah. that's what you think the undergrads do now, right? When you finally make that transistor that works on the, you know, at, at the, you know, single atomic scale, or, you know, you get that picture of an orbital, right? right. And you're the only one who has it, right? Yeah. Like people are naturally motivated to do that. The, yeah. the part of the leader is to help them clear the hurdles that they can't see okay right that's that's a yeah that's a whole i guess like what's nice about this type of thing is that this is more of a philosophy view of things rather than like if you read about management right it's all these like very overly specific things on how to kind of beat people into submission to do what you're supposed to do whereas yeah. you're saying people will do what they're supposed to do as long as they're not getting overly demotivated because they keep failing due to some factor that they cannot see themselves. So, exactly. so that's, that sounds like a good manager sounds like a really tough job because you have to understand your employees, you have to understand the work, and you have to make sure that you understand the dynamics of the team because if they get too discouraged by difficulties, that's, uh, 
Yeah. That's a tough thing. You know, people will never remember the actions that you take. They'll never mm-hmm. remember what you tell them. They'll never remember what you do, but they will remember how you make them feel and they will remember that you helped them. Yeah, that's they true. Might not help, but they will remember that you were helpful, right? Yeah, and yeah. That's, that's, a, that's a powerful thing if you want people to do stuff. So basically going back to what Elon Musk did when he was like, you know, call me, that's a very sort of like this type of thing, which is just like, you know, whatever obstacles, like I'm here to clear them. I, I don't care. Right. Yeah, yeah, so I see. And I think uh, the audience has asked a couple of questions. Um, okay. So I guess to wrap up uh, everything, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll ask some of the audience questions. So Rajni is asking, uh, how close do you believe your current career at Rock and Dine to be to your biology experience, or how how does it inform each other? Uh, they don't. They're completely separate. <laughs> All right. Well, Rajni, you got your answer. <laughs> completely separate. Um, and then uh, I think Joy was asking. She was saying that the view you see physics and experimental works is fascinating. Basically. How do you deal with just relentless failure, right? With, with these, like in physics, right? It doesn't care about your feelings. You nope. can just fail over and over again. And how do you deal with that kind of constant discouragement? Uh, it's it's not discouragement. It's it's information. It's data that you're getting, right? Mm-hmm. Physics is telling you you are going down the wrong path. I told you last time you're going down the wrong path. You're still going down the wrong path. Go this way. Don't go that way. Go this way. Mm-hmm. Right. And so, you know, the challenge is to really listen, if you can, to what the physics is telling you. And if if you, you know, you, you mentioned earlier that you can have an intuition about things. If you continue to have that kind of failure, it means your intuition is wrong. Yeah. Right. That's an extremely powerful insight that physics is giving you. Yeah. That's physics reaching into your mind saying, your image of what's happening here is incorrect. Mm-hmm. Right? That's a that's a hint that you need to go talk to other people or read more or find find a different path to go down. Right. But it exactly. is hard. And then once you've done it, once you've done the wrong thing nine hundred thousand times, and you do the right thing once, that feeling is indescribable. Uh, yes. A, Thank you so much for all of your time. You know, thank you so much. Thanks a lot.